always keep an open mind, I think uh, is, is one thing that has really served me well. I think in other words, open to ideas they may not be in your core area they may not be in your core field doesn't mean that they're not ideas that you can't sort of incorporate or think about in in your own work or your own area i find reasons to be optimistic every day and again the pace of evolution uh has been staggering i mean you just it's you just have to look back five years and realize how far we've come i'm confident that we have you know, the right kind of stakeholders, the right leaders, the right conversations are going on uh, to make sure that this stuff is effective, it's safe, and it's available to, to more people than ever. All right. So hello and welcome everyone to who's ever listening to this particular podcast. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Matthew Lundgren. Matthew Langren is uh, currently the Chief Medical Information Officer at Nuance Communications, a Microsoft company, and also holds part-time appointments with uh, University of California, San Francisco, and uh, as an associate clinical professor, and also as an adjunct faculty at Stanford and Duke. Few people might recognize him from his Coursera course on fundamentals of machine learning in healthcare. Uh, he's a radiologist by training and has led and contributed to multiple projects that use AI and deep learning for medical imaging and precision medicine. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Matt Langren MD and also at uh, LinkedIn uh, at Matt Langren MD. So Dr. Langren, it's finally nice to have you again on the show. Yeah, it's great to be back. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> so yeah, as we were uh, discussing, like a lot has changed since, since I had, uh, I think two years back on the show. So you recently took the role as a chief medical information officer at Nuance Communications. Like, can you tell me what exactly does that role entail and what does that role stand in the industry as a person who is coming from a medical background? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I just, uh, I joined this role uh, about seven, eight months ago. Um, but I had, as you as you may recall, I had done a sabbatical uh, with Microsoft uh, while I was still still a professor at Stanford. So it was it was definitely uh, a, a familiar territory for me. <laughs> uh, my, my role is actually it, it's it's an awesome it's super fun. So basically, what I tend to, to do most of the time is I sit in this sort of strategy part of the organization in this leadership team, and uh, in my role, I'm sort of working across the organizations. Uh, so all the way from Microsoft core research to uh, product and core uh, cloud services, all the way to the nuance first party solutions, which, of course, as you as you may know, have a, have a fairly significant footprint, uh, particularly in the U.S. healthcare market. Yeah, I see. And what kind of projects like do you currently involve yourselves? Like, are there any specific that you can talk about? Like, what exactly do they look like and what does your role fit into over there? Yeah, I mean, primarily, um, as we're starting to see more and more of these FDA cleared solutions uh, come out, and then of course, there's there's you know hundreds of of research papers and, and advancements kind of going on in the academic space. What uh, what I'm really focused on, or at least the purpose of, and, and what I'm most excited about, I think, is really just to say, well, you know, in my time in academics, certainly uh, continuing to see this, which is uh, there's a development to deployment gap. Um, I don't think it's a surprise uh, anyone who listens to this podcast um, would understand that, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of models that uh, we're building uh, in, in various academic communities, even in industry, uh, but then actually trying to get those into the hands of clinicians in a real work workflow, whether it's just to generate uh, real world evidence or actually be to have them uh, be used clinically, th that's, that's painful. Uh, it's a difficult thing to solve. And um, and so, you know, one of the really, really cool advantages uh, of both my role, but then just having these organizations uh, working together in the way that they are, is that it sort of becomes that bridge for the development to deployment gap, uh, both for, you know, things that we're working on, but then also for our, our customers, whether they be, you know, startups or, or medium to large size companies. And then, of course, providing that, that tool set uh, to, you know, academicians who are building things and want to say, hey, well, I, you know, it's working great in my test environment. You know, how is this going to work in, in, in real clinical data in a real clinical environment? And I think that 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 gap actually is one of the most challenging to solve because it's not just about, you know, core fundamental science or, you know, how well your model generalizes, but it's actually about the nuts and bolts and the infrastructure uh, related to actually getting a model to, to provide inference on, on real patient data. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping by, you know, whatever contributions I'm making, in addition to the hundreds of people sort of working together, 
on this uh, that we can see a, a faster uh, you know, build to deploy cycle and then uh, eventually have that real world evidence and feedback come back into the system and we can get closer to that uh, continuous learning uh, space that we all want to be a part of in the future. Yeah, this is interesting. And 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 like a follow-up question to that is like most of the times, like since before, before the stint at Microsoft, you did have a fair share of uh, uh, experience working in academia. And I, I still believe, like, I think you are involved. So how do, do these differences, like do you see a difference between how these research projects are initiated? Like in academic, I think it's like a much more fundamental question that we want to answer and like we develop or we innovate stuff or maybe we explore stuff just to answer that question and that's where it ends or maybe at the best case we have a publication and we 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 most of the time stop over there but versus how do these research work are they always tied to like a product they have a mind that they want to ship or like how do the exploration weightage go over there in industry yeah, it is different. I mean, you're right. I mean, there's some things that are the same, right? Which is like, if you're a good academician or you've had a successful career, you've become good at looking for what's next, right? And and asking the right questions and then designing, you know, an experiment or designing a team that can help address those those questions. I, I think that those things are the same. Um, but but your your point is, is taken well, which is, that, you know, we are uh, obviously, in, in in industry, thinking about you know who's going to use this, will it scale appropriately, right? Um, what are the other partner ecosystems that may be affected by this, either positively or potentially negatively? Uh, and then and then how is this driving, you know, sort of the core objectives of the business? Um, these are things that we don't often think about a lot, right, in the academic space. So. Um, while, you know, I spent a lot of my time, you know, uh, building up a lab, building up a program uh, in academics, you know, writing grants, uh, successfully sort of, you know, putting these resources together, it, it still, um, it still is, is a different, I think, perspective that I'm having to bring. In, and one of the reasons why I'm so excited to kind of learn uh, as, you know, as part of this ecosystem is you know how how can how can we actually enable the most possible people um, to achieve the kinds of things that you know we were successfully doing maybe back at Stanford or other labs are doing um, and and if we can achieve that uh, we we've, we've seen this and I, I may have talked about this last time I was on with you you know the power of the of the crowd the wisdom of the crowd right the ability for you know folks that have data science backgrounds but maybe don't have access to data or have data and ideas but don't have access to the tools. That they need to to really explore uh, explore their ideas. So, you know, to me that that's that's really the the, the key fundamental difference. I'm thinking more about now um, how can how can the most possible people benefit uh, from the things that we're building um, and almost kind of being becoming an enabler and um, no longer sort of it has to be my idea it has to be my solution or product. That's not the, that's not the goal anymore. It's really okay. We can see what's coming around the corner. That's the same. But then, uh, how can we prepare, you know, an infrastructure, a, a, a you know, a, a suite of services and solutions that can help others, you know, make it around that corner and and advance their advance in, into the into the sort of next thing, um, and and that's what we want to do here. Yeah. This is interesting. Then let me ask you this question. I think in the last one, we we were talking more about like how can we were exploring as in like um, how exactly can AI fit into the medical industry. But right now in the past two years, I think there's a fair amount of work, at least in terms of taking this thing into a real world scenario. Like there has been lots of startups, uh, lots of uh, efforts from big companies that have been going into this particular domain. Do you think, like in the in 2022, do you think AI is uh, kind of ready for like a prime time use in in the in the industry or in like in real world scenarios where it is interacting or maybe being used by people who do not have a fair background of medical uh, sorry AI AI, AI uh, understandings of working? Do you think it is still ready, or 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 at least are we on the pathway to that over there? EJ, I, I I fundamentally believe in the technology. I I um, I've been a part of literally hundreds of these projects. I think folks have seen uh, you know work in their own in their own areas or their own uh, labs and things. And, and certainly in the startup space, we've seen products that can do things that are going to provide a significant advantage uh, for healthcare probably. Um, but there's still two bottlenecks, you know, to sort of see what we know is possible 
to uh, getting that into the hands of, of clinicians. And again, part of that's infrastructure, which we sort of discussed a little bit, which is, is how do we bridge that gap for the most possible people uh, and make it as, you know, as easy and safe as possible to do that. The other piece of though, is, is at least in the US um, and certainly in some other countries is, is regulatory, right? So yeah. if, if you're a, a startup and you've got a really amazing comprehensive solution for, let's just use the example for a chest X-ray, um, we've seen results of these solutions, not only helping clinicians make better decisions, make less mistakes, potentially uh, get, get patients care faster, um, et cetera. Uh, but, but because of sort of the regulatory framework that, that's, that's sort of been put together, um, we're still kind of treating these things as software, which have a couple of disadvantages. One of them, of course, is that we don't have the ability to, to really use uh, you know, what is essentially a stochastic technology, we're kind of forcing it into a software box, right, to make it, uh, to make it sort of fit. And the other piece, yeah. of course, is that um, there's this 510k approval process that we've seen, obviously, many uh, startups kind of go, I think there's more than 300 now just in the medical imaging space. But a lot of that is very limited in terms of what they're able to, to do in, in a clinical practice. So even if I have a comprehensive solution, let's say that can do you know, dozens and dozens of findings and, and comprehensively look at a given image, taking that through regulatory in the current environment is going to take many years, right? Because yeah. you can only uh, submit so many findings for approval. Um, and each of those may be only used in practice for triaging things, which obviously is fundamentally less helpful than the things it can potentially do. And so I think we're still kind of figuring this out. It's it's obviously we're, we're working through a conservative uh, you know, kind of regulatory environment at the same time as we're wrestling with how to actually get these things deployed. And so both of those things, I think, are, are why we're seeing this gap. Um, I, I like to think that, you know, we were just at the RSNA, uh, you know, a month or so ago, which is obviously the largest radiology conference. Hundreds of vendors were there uh, with some pretty amazing solutions. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, what they can actually be used for in practice huge difference than compared to uh, the NRIPS conference, which was happening around the same time. <laughs> and we saw like, oh my gosh, like these same kinds of technology that these companies are are capable of, of building can do so much more. Uh, yeah. how, do, how do we get, how do we line those things up so that the gap isn't so large between what we know is possible and, and what we're currently uh, currently seeing? Yeah, it's 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 funny that you mentioned about the regular uh, regular regulations thing that you mentioned about the countries. And I was at the Mekai in September, and they mentioned like they have like a very AI AI in healthcare space debate. And I'm forgetting I'm forgetting uh, who was speaking in that those debates, but I think there were two people. One of the guys was who was like leading multiple startups in China, and they actually showcased the use case scenarios where they have multiple startups that are purely based on AI tools, and they are able to like clinicians or any kind of uh, experts, medical experts can actually use these tools and reach to very uh, remote places where they physically cannot travel. And versus, I think there was a debate point that was concerned in is compared to China, the other countries like US and UK have like very strong regulate, uh, regulations uh, in these kind of spaces. So the, the debate point all exactly was what you said, like as in like, do we do we need to lease up these kind of regulations in order to allow these things versus um, the concern that uh, these regulations already uh, handle. So do you think like, do we need to, do we need to loosen up on a little bit on the regulations or are they fairly in place, but we need to focus more on like a very strong validation framework for these AI tools to be passing these regulations? I, I mean, your point, yeah, I think the answer is probably both, right? I think we're all, everyone's learning together. Um, remember, this field is, what is it, five five years old, really? I mean, ultimately, yeah. maybe five or six years old, just in terms of the application of some of these things in practice. Um, I, but I, you know, I do agree that, you know, rather than sort of loosening, I think it needs to evolve is probably the word I'd use. And I, and I expect that to continue to happen. I think we're already seeing evolution. There's a, the FDA has done a phenomenal job in sort of working with community leaders and, and key opinion leaders and others to try to figure out exactly how do we do this in the safest possible way so that yeah. you know patients can reap the benefits without having to be exposed to additional risks. I, I think that's that's of course the right mentality to take to it. However, what I what I would wonder is is you know whether that single governing body is sufficient to uh to sort of allow this ecosystem to to, to move at the pace it probably could. 
And, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of different folks uh, with different takes on this. You know, I've heard some suggestions, which I've liked in, in panels, uh, probably similar to the panel you were you were talking about, where, where you know, folks have suggested, is there not a, a mechanism by which we could, um, you know, identify centers of excellence around medical imaging AI? So they have a multidisciplinary team that have the, the, the capabilities to both build and deploy and evaluate and safely monitor. Um, would there not be a designation for some of those groups to be able to to, to move a little bit further ahead without having to, you know, kind of go back through what is it now a, really a bottleneck in terms of getting mm -hmm. approval, both in terms of, of, of personnel and resources, right, on the part of the FDA, uh, but then just on the part of, you know, how, how can they keep track um, of all of these things kind of going on all over the place without some other sort of surrogate approach? I, I, again, I've heard of like having, you know, some of the societies form as honest brokers, a lot of different ideas are being thrown around, but but the the idea, of course, is that what is the framework that we ultimately need to agree upon, where we can you know sort of take things into into practice again, hopefully with an infrastructure that allows us to you know safely deploy and monitor, and then you know feel comfortable with periodic audits or a periodic uh, sort of you know monitoring to allow us to say, hey, this is still safe or this is okay now we've identified potentially a model maybe that's experiencing drift or not working as well as 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 you know initially intended can we retrain that now and, and then what is the, what are the steps for that and i think i think that's where we're going to need to be you know as, as as i mentioned these technologies uh when used in other areas uh you know they they can continuously learn and particularly be suit, well suited to sort of get towards that precision uh, medicine kind of concept where there's a there's a certain population that this model is incredibly well suited for. So, you know, long story short, I I think that I, I agree with the conservative approach 100% as a patient. I want to make sure that anything that's being used to, you know, take part in my healthcare is, uh, you know, is meeting a very high bar. At the same time, again, I, I, I've, I've I think we could all agree that there's opportunities for this technology to do more. And we just need to figure out the best way to do that. Yeah, yeah. And and what other question is like, do these like I think there's also a hype or maybe a, like a buzzword around the uh, around these terms like interpretability, explainability, or like a transparency of these models. And I was recently helping my professor write like the uh, the new NIH uh, R01 grant, and we we did discuss about these things. And like, how much do you think is this like fitting into the framework that you are saying? Um, uh, redeploy or like retrain the models and go back in an iterative process. Do you think these are like an important building blocks into that process? Or is it just more like a very nice thing to have? Like it's not a very necessary thing, but it's like just, okay, if the model is explainable, I would appreciate that. But it's, or do you think this is like a many, uh, like it's like, a, I would say like an important milestone into that framework? Yeah, ex explainability is a tricky one. I, I think it, it, it almost always the answer is going to be it depends, I think, right? Because, I you know, at some level, some of the models, uh, uh, you know, maybe in practice, not every clinician is going to say, okay, I need to see exactly why this decision was made. Um, but at the same time, I think in the experimental phase, having some aspect of explainability built into, you know, the, the sort of the model engineering process is important. Um, it, 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 to me, it's tricky. I think, I think ultimately, um, at least, you know, sort of the consensus seems to be moving a, a little bit away from our, our, I think our initial feeling, which was that everything needs to be explainable. Uh, we've also found, um, in a lot of our work and work from others, you know, that some of the techniques, some of the, at least in computer vision, the pixel based attribution techniques that we've been relying on, like grad camera things. Uh, they may not be they may not be good enough, so to speak, right? Uh, at least in in some of the shortcut learning type of approaches that that a lot of models are trained with, right? Um, that may change a little bit as folks are starting to move uh, closer to and on in the one on the one hand, very carefully segmented, you know, models where you know there's there's at least a causal relationship that's much more easy uh, easy yeah. to sort of backtrack into and, and explore. Um, but at the at the same time. Uh, I think, you know, folks that listen, this would be very familiar with the sort of large language models and all the buzz that's starting to, to really build very quickly around them. In fact, just read a paper today um, uh, by, by the Google DeepMind group that have sort of worked with their large language model, Palm, to, to sort of 
start oh, to do Q and A in the medical space, right? So we are getting to a place, and, and the reason I bring that up now is that in the in the context of explainability, I can't think of a more difficult model to probe <laughs> for explainability than a large language model, right? We I don't think we we fundamentally sorted that out, and I I think at some level, um, you know, if we can if we can provide you know, a, a sort of a wrapper around some of these models where they're able to give citations and, and you know, convince us in the medical community, particularly around medical advice or guidance that this is coming from an evidence-based source or this is search the PubMed literature or this is coming from a reputable place. I think that would be the explainability level that we would expect rather than saying, you know, how exactly, which parameters, which data, right, was this, was this sort of drawn from in order to, to sort of uh, hold that up as the explainable uh, necessity, right? For every single decision, it's a tough one. So I, I, I almost see I'm seeing two different branches really kind of starting to form. Um, but at the same time, as a clinician, if I can if I can trust that the model has is seeing the data it's supposed to see, meaning there hasn't been any significant drift, and I have an infrastructure in place to assure that, or that at least give me a heads up. If it's a, then, then I then I I feel like I don't necessarily need to click and look for every uh, pixel that you know the model made a decision on. I would have some more trust with that, um, it, as long as I had again that sort of uh, you know infrastructure to say this model is seeing what it's expecting to see. Maybe there's a, a monitor for the confidence. Maybe there's a monitor for the data, et cetera. But you know we've we've looked at a lot of these things, and I feel like we can, we're close. We're close to having that place where. Again, I don't need to do a grad cam for every image that I, I'm, I'm looking at an AI decision on. I see, I see. But yeah, this is something like I also had like a very hard time wrapping around my head because like I think I, I want to make like this uh, part of my thesis also as in, can I can I propose a solution that is not strictly like a from coming from a computer science, but as in like because I work with people who have background in Alzheimer's and post traumatic headache. So like, can I devise some kind of framework that can make more that can make a, a framework that can explain the models that I've already built. I'm not innovating anything over there, but as in like a framework that can help uh, medical experts interact with something what you said, like the model might be giving citations to a few things, but I still get my get my thing myself confused about like, how do I approach this apart from grad cam and terms of strictly medical imaging? Because at the end, the model is trying to do like some kind of classification or regression which has like a very uh, univariate or multivariate output, how do I how do I relate it back to my input, which was the only thing the model saw that was like an image. So yeah, uh, it, it's something very interesting. I don't know, uh, but uh, something what you said is maybe making more sense. Some kind of domain level language. Like I think one of the other speakers that I had previous to you was working on symbolic AI and something that he suggested was something very interesting. I mean, it's very hard to do, but like having some kind of symbolic way of representing language and then the model is trying to talk back to medical experts maybe that might be a way forward but again the dictionary yeah, is very I, limited we've done some yeah you know we've I, i've seen some work in sort of uh you know breaking down sort of the the free text kind of aspect at least of what we do in our in our world right we have an it, it, i mean in theory we have an image prompt and we create a free text sort yeah. of caption if you want to look at it that way um and and can we can we take the sort of the decisions by the models there's Obviously, large efforts by you know big societies like Arsene and ACR to work together on you know uh, clinical data elements, right? Uh, where where you know the, the the we at least have a common language for the output of the models. That's one you know way to sort of more structure make that more structured. The other is is to your point, can we use like a, a you know rad graph is one of the things we propose, but there's others to break down the relationships and then have them you know the joint embedding space is much more easier to sort of probe. Uh, particularly when, you know, we're using contrast of learning other things. So, yeah, I, but I agree, I, you know, at, at some level, let's just, if we, even if we're just being reasonable, none of these, let's say none of these solutions completely went out. At the end of the day, what I'm expecting, if I'm in the regulatory space, particularly, I'm going to expect to say, give me a standardized kind of model card. You've seen the work, you know, by, by the folks at Duke at one point showing like, you know, the ingredients where it works, where it doesn't. And and then maybe just a periodic report that's in some ways standardized to say, OK, well, you know, in, in the first quarter of last year, this model did, you know, this well, uh, this, you know, it, it had some 
drift in confidence or whatever on this particular diagnosis, that kind of information just at a high level, um, I think would make everyone feel much more comfortable that these systems mm -hmm. as they're working in the world um, are continuing to perform the way that we expected. Would it be nice if every model we could do, you know, very point to point explainability? Yes, I think it would be. And I don't, I don't rule that out as being possible, but I, I would want that to sort of block, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of inclusion of these models in, into our practices because we can't get the explainability thing sorted out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And let me ask you one more um, non-obvious question uh, is, uh, sorry, uh, an obvious question is uh, in medical research, we normally have these tendency of having very small data sets. And I know, I mean, this is a very, like, you can see the question coming, but I want to see, like, uh, I want to uh, understand your perspective in the last two years. Do you see any methods that you think are making a way forward towards addressing this issue? Do you think, because I mean, we have done a massive job at, at least from a medical standpoint where we have data sets to train on. We have certainly much more public data sets that people can uh, experiment on, but like it's still like the institutional uh, access is very limited. Only few people can access, not everybody can, can train models and test models. Do you think any from AI or computer science perspective, do you have have any kind of techniques really stood out your, your attention into these things? 100%. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we're, so again, just to set the stage, I mean, data has, of course, been a big part of my career, you know, not just the sort of solving yeah. some of the data access, but also just the, the quality of data, et cetera. I think, you know, at some level, uh, there's a couple of forces that are that are kind of coming to bear on this problem. One is, as you pointed out, there's still massive data scarcity. And I'm speaking in particular from, you know, the medical imaging space, but you could say that pretty much about all medical data, right? Mm -hmm. There's just some, if the fact that we still have hundreds of thousands of papers in the bioinformatics literature, that's uh, that's all being built on that cohort of you know five years from Beth Israel, uh, which yeah. makes up the mimic data set, the ICU page. It's 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 almost like they've shown repeatedly how valuable that data has been for us advancing our our knowledge, and yet we still haven't been able to uh, to create a larger ecosystem, at least successfully. I think we're heading there that has a comprehensive. Uh, you know, secure, de-identify patient data for us to learn patterns from and 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 build new solutions for. Uh, but so so there's this lockdown sort of, a, and obviously there's privacy there. But there's another force I think that's causing that, which is that I think, and increasingly rightly so, uh, institutions are seeing that data as a, as an asset, as as a potentially something that they can uh, you know benefit from financially, and mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily lead to folks wanting to give their data away right or to share it it's not a it's not a sort of a resource that can be you know depleted right this is something yeah. that can be copied so so it's a little bit it's a little bit interesting that it's really just the control of the access to that data that creates this kind of uh i guess scarcity that that allows there to be a sort of a monetary price attached to data and of course we could go into which we won't now the, the <laughs> massive industry that sort of sits behind the scenes and and sort of buys and sells uh, de-identified medical data all day. However, that all that being said, there are two big trends. I think they're going to uh, really help uh, sort of loosen up the access to data. One, of course, is that you know as the NIH and other large you know uh, uh, scientific groups and, and 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 sort of organizations are saying, listen, you know we're seeing a lot of advancement by by groups that have access to data. Um, we are seeing people get grants and then publish that yet others aren't able to benefit from that work. Uh, maybe there's some code out there, but they're not getting access to the data that made up you know, that advancement. And I think, you know, as you know, I believe starting next month, it, this will be the, the first time where it will no longer just be kind of a nice to have suggestion from the, from the 300,000, uh, for the 300,000 researchers that are funded by the NIH around the world. It will actually be sort of like, what is your plan? You need to have a yeah. plan for making the data available for other research. Otherwise, you know, all of our tax dollars are going into funding this research. <laughs> we're seeing how cool they are. And yet we're not getting that ecosystem effect, that network effect of others being able to build on that. Even reproducibility is, is in question, right? In some cases. So, so there's a yeah. lot of reasons why this is an important effort. I think that's going to start to lead to groups saying, okay, we need to have you know, a way to, uh, you know, obviously safely and, um, and and responsibly share medical data that was used for, you know, NIH funded and other types of, of advanced research. And a lot of that, of course, is going to be in the AI field. 
the other piece, to, you know, to sort of finally sort of say, what's another good, <laughs> why am I optimistic? I think that's one reason I do, I do think folks are re recognizing sharing is possible. But the other thing I think that's, that's really going to change the game is, is going to be the degenerative technique. So, you know, we could have talked on this podcast last time about, you know, GANs and the pros and cons. And I, you know, I was very lukewarm. I, again, a lot of great GAN research, still a little lukewarm on its, on its ability to truly create data that was useful for, uh, for, for, for clinically important models. Right. I, I still yeah. was a little on the fence, you know, partially by the feature space, partially, but just, it just wasn't quite right. Now with stable diffusion, obviously, <laughs> which is, I mean, just an elegant, I love when things are like simple and elegant and they work incredibly well, because that's, to me, that this is a, a key example of that. And so the kinds of work, again, some of the, my, my former colleagues at Stanford have done some great work already with creating, uh, you know, synthetic data, essentially, from, from using the stable diffusion technique, but on chest x-ray data, again, still fairly limited. Imagine now if you had the kind of scale of imaging and ideally image text pairs that potentially um, that, you know, large tele centers would have. Now you're talking about the opportunity, could we make data that can be sufficiently used to train a clinically uh, useful model? Now that's that's something I'm pretty excited about. And I, and I do think that if that turns out to be possible, and I don't have many reasons to believe it won't be, if, if not now in the near future, well, now you're talking about uh, really creating a, a system where I can create, you know, let's just say, but there's a vending machine almost, right? I can go in yeah. and I can say, I need chest x-rays on, you know, female patients in their 40s with, you know, some rare thing I could even, you know, I could literally list out the things that I would want to, to use. And that can be for, you know, augmentation techniques, right? Uh, yeah. For models that are failing on maybe some subcategories in their overall performance, or it could be used to just train more robust models in general. Um, so I'm incredibly bullish on it. And I, and I think that um, if for the first time in a long time, I don't have to feel like I'm, you know, running around, you know, <laughs> With with my soapbox saying, hey, we should be sharing more data. Maybe we can create the data, and if we can create again, this is this comes back to infrastructure and 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 sort of um, resources. But if we can create an environment where this is something that the community can use, uh, I I don't see any reason why uh, the forces aren't aligning for for this to be the next opportunity uh, to get data in the hands of, of people who could build models. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think like a heads up to the second point that you mentioned was using you know, like using deficient models to create synthetic data. A drawback, like I think we recently saw. So we had one paper that was using a uh, GAN-based approach for anomaly detection. So we have like uh, like the model is trained on healthy patients and and anomaly anomalous patients comes in and you can identify and it can also localize as in which um regions it can do. And the reason we developed that model was because we were working with migraine and migraine is a very heterogeneous uh, problem set itself. Like people with the same set of severity in migraine can have totally different looking MRI scans. So like, mm -hmm. the, like from a data perspective. So what we realized was like, can we use deficient model? And we have like a very small data set you can imagine like we just have 50 patients which i mean from the medical standpoints of collaborators they feel like that's a great number but for yeah. us like when we have to train model that's like i mean th those are peanuts but i mean i don't want to undermine like they had they did tremendous work to getting those patients enrolled and everything but when we tried our GAN based approach, we replaced the whole framework with deficient models. And the problem set was when we were generating models from the diseased space or the anomalous space, they were massively wrong from a medical standpoint. Mm -hmm. As in, like when we showed it, like we, we created the whole everything, uh, synthetic data in a perfectly visible format. And when we showed it, the, the lesions or the kind of anomalies that they were trying to see they were completely off the marks. And that was something like, I mean, we, we, we were trying to like publish these as, as like a very, you know, like a limitation of diffusion models or something. But again, we are very, we are very conservative because we use a very small data set. So it's very hard to report like a very, uh, uh, like benchmark results. But that was something very, um, new to us and also on the first point i think uh, i do agree uh, what you said as, as in like there's a tendency that we need to make public data sets uh, sorry data sets uh, available publicly uh, when, when I when I joined, I think uh, my PhD program, one of the points was like as a computer science student, like I already had the dream of like hosting a workshop or like a challenge, you know, like uh, a lot of people do that. And when I had these data sets, I asked my professor, can I do this? And she was like, okay, go ahead, like you can try that. And the kind of 
turmoil I had, like dealing with people, getting these data sets into like a challenge at Mekai or any kind of medical, I just gave up. After one year, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to focus on my research and just maybe try to do it. Because I, I do agree, like there are lots of um, individual private groups or labs that do like can benefit from these. Like you have seen like at Mekai over the last three or four years, like NVIDIA and lots of companies come up with so many great models just for that data set. And that's amazing. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's like a chaos, at least for a, from a student perspective, it's, it's hard to do that. I mean, kudos to you for trying and, and yeah, it is, it, it shouldn't be this hard. I mean, ultimately it shouldn't be this hard. I I, I yeah. recognize the the importance of you know all the the, the factors that go into it, but it it shouldn't, especially from the research perspective. Again, you know we've we've really tried to hit home the idea that if the data can be used for you know research and education purposes, that tends to be really it fits nicely into that public good argument. Again, that we say if if everyone would benefit from this data being made available, again, in a responsible way, which we've shown we can do, um, that, then I think that that outweighs any of the other, you know, mitigating factors that that concern some folks. And But it's it's all about comfort. I, and I, I think I've seen, at least over the last two years, to your point, um, a lot of folks hitting their head against that wall. But But even despite the fact that you don't feel like you were successful, I actually think that just by having that conversation, has started the progress in your institute. And I think that's what you're seeing in a lot of places. And it just, mm -hmm. someone will eventually get there, but because of, you know, you kind of introducing the, the concept, maybe one of the first people to do so at your place, I think the next few people will have an easier time. And I'm hoping that's, that's continuing to be the case. You know, we host all these challenges, RSNA, obviously the Mackay ones are great. There's, you know, many others who are, you know, putting together medical challenges. And I think, you know, that's one way to, to sort of get folks rallied uh, and really show the crowdsourcing ability. What we haven't shown, and I'd like to do this, and this is something that we're thinking about for our, at least as you know, my role at the RSNA for our challenges, is that now could we take the top models? Because everyone just says, these are overfitting challenges, right? We're not actually <laughs> creating something that can be very valid in, in a clinical environment because we've just overfit yeah. to the task. I think that's a fair argument and it's probably true. Uh, but but yet, are there ways that we can sort of look at that critically? So I don't think anyone's really taken this seriously and say, let's take the top 10, you know, finalists from from a medical imaging challenge. And let's actually apply that to, an, you know, an external data set. Let's apply that to more of a generalized, uh, maybe even as a, as a real world data trial and see yeah. whether it's is it technique based. Is it is there something other than just the fact that they won the challenge or maybe some other place lower that didn't overfit as much, but maybe they're more useful clinically. So I think we're going to learn a lot from this. But again, we couldn't even have this conversation if yeah. folks weren't able to make data available. And, and that goes back to a lot of the research, right? Like, you know, research on, you know, bias. I, I, I don't think that's fundamentally something that startups want to start probing too much, right? They're yeah. out there trying to have impact, get, get market, you know, share. They're not thinking, okay, well, where does my product really cause some problems? Clearly, it's important, but the research community, that's a perfect thing for the research community to tackle, right? And I think that's, again, only possible if we have a common language, meaning a common data set that we can say, hey, I took these public data sets and I showed that you can identify self-reported race, or I showed that it under underperforms in, you know, young men below 20, whatever those things are, these are important conversations that we should be having in yeah. the open. And, and again, I, I think that as we get closer to a place where, where, you know, you have the, on the one hand, you know, research organizations, funding mechanisms that say, we need you to share your data. On the other hand, you have opportunities for, again, maybe synthetic data really does have this sea change. And I expect that to happen in the next year. Um, maybe those forces will come together in a way that we no longer have to spend time on our podcast talking about the data scarcity <laughs> problem because it's, you know, it, it's starting to get, uh, you know, trending towards maybe being solved. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I love that. So I think we 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 did talk about. So this is very interesting. I didn't expect, but I think we did talk about large language models. We also talked about diffusion GANs. And let me ask you, like the maybe the last one that has has been most most trending in twenty twenty two vision transformers and i think that the time i reached out i think i i saw a new publication from uh where one of you 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 were one of the co-authors is 
using vision transformers and medical imaging space. Like from a very brief perspective, I, I mean, I don't expect you to understand exactly how transformers and attentions work, but do you think like in terms of results or the benchmark results that it, they are trying to produce, do you think they are kind of outperforming at least in certain tasks compared to CNNs that we had like maybe a year back or two years back? Because the reason I ask is like, even at Mekai this year and last year, there were more than like, I think 60% of the papers were exploring vision transformers majorly for segmentation and also for classification. Do you, do you see, or this is just maybe like a new exploratory trend? Um, well, I, I like the transformers, not just be, okay. Again, I, I think that the CNN versus transformer versus whatever, I think, uh, I could, I think any lab could, if you were telling them, Hey, show that this is better than one, you know, show one is better than the other. You can do that. I, I, I fundamentally believe that, you know, you can, a lot of these techniques for narrow use cases are probably going to end up doing this back, back and forth in terms of this one's better. This yeah. one's better. We go from attention is all you need to back to, <laughs> you know, convolutions are all you need whatever. I don't, yeah. but, 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 but the, one of the reasons I'm really, again, this, this ties back into what we're starting to see more broadly in the field, which is that, um, I I want to I, I it's it's are you a do you believe do you truly believe that there's that there's it's possible to create a general model, mm -hmm. or do you think we have to have ten thousand narrow models or whatever the number is, and um, just practically thinking I, I I would almost rather work on the problem that is general because the 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 upside is so much bigger. And um, of course, the challenge then is that it requires a massive amount of compute, a massive amount of data. Um, but but I like that the, the the transformer approach, at least for me, particularly with this joint embedding, you know, sort of we've you know seen the work from from Microsoft Research, the BioVille paper. I can actually get to a place where the joint embedding space is precise enough that this sentence corresponds to this set of pixels, and and to me. Um, that's opening a door to saying maybe we can get closer to that general model because if it's really just understanding as I would imagine we could sort of boil down that humans understand those pixels mean this thing that's the concept that I'm in my own head embedding head I'm saying yeah. that's what it represents to me and I'm going to say those words I think having that level of you know, facility between the, the two modalities and frankly, other modalities, right? We can talk about language and, and even video. I, I, I fundamentally feel like that's the problem with working, working on, particularly if you have access to the data and, and the, and the compute resources to, to start to probe it. Um, I also feel like um, practicality, at least if you're saying, I'm, you know, what, what if I'm a startup, am I going to try to, I don't know if you try to create that general, I think you would say, okay, I'm going to take whatever technique of the day is the most effective on my data set, because I know that when it comes time for deployment, it comes time for inference, I the, I can't have just an API stuck onto some massive model. That's a harder thing for a startup to sort of really wrap their head around and really probably pull the resources together to do. So, you know, again, long way of saying, you know, I, I personally am most excited about multimodality and i and i do yeah. feel like again you could use obviously convolutions to create the, the embeddings for the image as well but i just like how the things tend to fit together personally from my simplistic point of view between the image and the text uh with a transformer approach yeah 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 definitely i think um i think we we, we i completely second that and that was one of the reasons i got interested in transformers like not because they are outperforming cnns or something but there was one very nice review study that that per, that per did some experiments and saying that when we use multimodal approach, like we can also use multimodal approach with CNNs, but the attention that is given to different modalities is very wrong or like not that much accurate, even though like it's a very overfitting issue. Like, yes, it can predict or it can segment everything. But when we use transformer based models, we might be losing accuracy, but at, as in a way forward towards multimodality, which is very critical, at least in medical science, that has a way forward. So that is something that really intrigued me. Like, okay, I don't really care about accuracy or something that I'm trying to yeah. monitor, but if it if it helps me way forward. And when I when I collaborate with people from Mayo and when we're working on these kind of very personalized problem, you know, like migraine, like which is very like like it, it's still an open problem. Like at least for other like things like uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, they do have like a medical st strong background where they have drugs and everything so like 
they exactly know what are the biomarkers, what are the underlying reasons by a certain extent. But when we use these kind of very nuanced medical problems, I think multimodal approach has a much, much more importance rather than just using single modality uh, prognosis or diagnostic models. Yeah, because I think part of what part of your work is is to sort of look at, like you pointed out, we don't have a lot of great biomarkers. So can we find yeah. some? And, and no. that's a little different, right? That's a little different than saying, I just want to mimic this human task, right? I, I actually need to do, I need to advance, uh, you know, the human's understanding of this problem. And and hopefully, you know, again, you might be able but to, to me, multimodality is the, is the way to do that, right? You, you have this opportunity to take advantage of, you know, a number of dimensions that humans can't process and yeah. find that number of dimensions where, you know, the, the features that you need are all in one place. And yeah. maybe that's a thousand dimensions. I don't know, but eventually you'll get there, right? The whole idea of the kernel trick, right? You'll eventually get to a place where, whether or not it's overfitting, but that's for you to decide. But, but, but those features really do provide new knowledge if you can trace it back and make it reproducible. I love that, and you know, I, I feel I feel like we've seen uh, a lot of new knowledge come from uh, incredibly feature rich modalities that mm -hmm. had you know relatively basic sort of human uh, workflows. I, and you know, one area I really am interested in is sort of the, the you know pathology as you take in digital pathology, massive amount of features, huge image, multiple yeah. magnification. I mean, just there's so much data there. There's it would take it would take a human all day just to process one right to do that thoroughly in the way that uh, you know some of the models and then and in aggregate are we getting more information that we can sort of tease out and say actually this corresponds to outcomes or this corresponds to response to this drug. Um, I, again, I think that that's a really fruitful way to approach it. Um, taking these models, not just again, to reproduce what we do, but to tell yeah. us something new. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. I think that's, that's one of the works that I recently did. And like, I'm, I'm really like, I, I don't care about the accuracy of those models, but as in <laughs> we, we, we published like, uh, it, it's a very standard approach from a, any, anyone who is from a computer science background wouldn't find that paper very interesting because what we did was like, we use, uh, off the, off the chart resonant 18 model. But what we did was once we have these models trained, we developed an end to like back to pipeline where we use free surfer based tools to map it back to the original ROIs of the brain. So how can we do that? And like, that was something, I mean, I, mean, I, I still don't know, like I, I see like my collaborators happy with those results. So I, that's my indirect way of being happy. But I think that <laughs> that is something like biomarker discovery really intrigues me because I don't care if if it's like a 97% or 99% accurate. So yeah, I, I even I personally would like to see much more um, being done into that front but. and i think it'll be possible too with um and you know the other area as you were talking i was just realizing there's this genomics aspect to it all right and and you know if we were having this conversation three years ago people would be like well <laughs> sequencing a genome is expensive and you know how do we but now it's like well uh i think the the newest scanners i've, I've just recently heard you can do a whole sequence for around 200 bucks it's mm. starting to come to the place where maybe everyone can be you know sort of sequenced as part of healthcare. And yeah. we also have a massive amount of data, right? With uh, data storage opportunities with cloud. Are we going to get to a place where, well, now that's a, that's a space where, again, you definitely need, uh, you know, computer science and machine learning techniques to, to draw that, you know, phenotypic to genotypic inferences and understand those relationships better. And uh, again, a whole nother opportunity, you know, we could also say the same about drug discovery, et cetera. So a lot of cool things are coming. Um, but but they're sort of along the lines of the way you're looking at the problem, which is like, what new knowledge can I bring to the table from this massive amount of data? Um, I, I love it. Yeah, yeah, true. And 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 despite uh, despite all that we discussed, like, do you like because you you do come from like there are only few people that I can think of who really work at the intersection where you, they understand both the both the domains very equally and nicely, but. When you when you talk to people who are strictly from medical uh, medical uh, science, what is the sentiment that you that you see when we when we, when you make use of AI models? Is it like truly changing over the years? Is it something that uh, I don't believe that I'll still stick to my my training training science that I'm doing, which is I mean right correctly right. But what what is the sentiment? Do you see it changing? Is it completely changed in the last three years? I do. I mean, I can usually gauge it by just the kind of questions that I get on these panels, you know, various conferences and things, right? For like for a couple of years at the beginning, it was like, you know, 
is AI going to replace me? Should I not even, you know, go into this, you know, field or whatever? I mean, there's a lot, there's legitimate, just kind of a huge misunderstanding potentially. And, and there's a lot of hype and that you take it at face value because these seem like smart people and they're saying this can do this and you, you take it uh, and agree with it. But um, I think there's been a, I think there's been a two, two things have happened. One, I think is that the, the audience, meaning the, the, the clinicians largely, uh, have become much more sophisticated in their understanding of the technology. Clearly, it's coming into all the parts of our lives anyway. And so we're starting to see, well, yeah, you know, Siri works for this sometimes, but it also sucks sometimes too. And, and that's that that's that sort of understanding, okay, I need to learn how to work effectively with this technology. I think that's the kind of question I'm getting more often, which is that um, why can't it do this better? Um, because it, that actually would provide a better ROI. And um, the, you know, that again, the discussions are more about, you know, these are the four or five bigger problems that I need you, meaning the community to help solve. I don't need you to tell me that there's a pneumothorax. I need you to, you know, tell me if the whole thing's normal to a high enough degree that I can actually save some time in my practice. These are the kinds of things I think. So again, it's more bi-directional. I think the, the level of understanding from the clinic, clinical community about these technologies has increased quite a bit. I would also say at the same time, the the tech understanding of clinical problems has increased quite a bit. So th this is where it, it's a it's like a it's actually a conversation we're watching happen in slow motion all the time, right? <laughs> all these millions of little interactions between clinicians and and technology and, and computer scientists. That that to me is 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 the necessary work that we're going to need to get us to that to that next stage. And again, this and just from a personal perspective, you know, part of the reason I spent so much time is you know, sort of, you know, my own lab. And then we had the big center where we're kind of bringing groups together, forming multidisciplinary teams, creating, you know, sort of larger groups and having those conversations. And then recognizing that when I did interact from, you know, my academic role, from my clinical role with a technology only kind of a company or, or group, there was that gap needs to be sort of bridged as well, right? It's not just between the clinician and machine learning. It's actually between industry and academia slash medicine. And 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 that I think is is going to be, and that's again why I, I I made this decision to say, well, I need to learn more too. I need to I need to learn how to see the world through the eyes of of a technology company of an academic coming into that space and saying, okay, now I understand why these things are prioritized or these things aren't. And it's been it's been eye opening and and for me transformational. I've certainly learned an incredible amount, and I think that that knowledge I hope. We'll go back into being able to solve some of these problems for, you know, my colleagues in healthcare and, and in academia. Yeah, no, I agree with that, and I think that was also one of the things that I personally, like, I mean, coming from a very student perspective, definitely not at the scale that you are. But when I joined, like, I think uh, I definitely underlooked the idea of working with medical professionals and working on projects that are truly at the intersection of medical AI. And even still, till date, like, I think the few publications that I had like a year back still trying to understand what metrics we are optimizing for because i mean it's very completely easy to understand from a very computer science perspective at the end it's just maybe two three metrics that we do but when i think defining the metrics um from a real world perspective, I think that one of the other, like I can give a quick example is when we were trying to develop these end-to-end -end pet modality translations like PETs, uh, it, I still like, even after two years, I still have a very hard time understanding what exactly are we optimizing for? Because it's not something when we are generating new images, it's not just like some kind of structural similarity or PSNR that we are optimizing for, but it's like understanding how exactly are these pets being used for quantification of like cognitive loads, like because these are Alzheimer's patients. At the end, we want to make sure that we can get some kind of mental scores that we use. And that that idea, like wrapping your head around, because we want to develop models that can optimize specifically for that. I don't want the brain structures to be completely synthesized. So this is something I definitely underlooked a lot. But maybe like, I, I just want to probe you a little bit more because I think you started off this role in, in this particular domain itself is, do you still think that the gap between uh, computer science collaborating with medical researchers and the other way around is um, a significant one? Like, as in like, uh, I think one of the panels that I, I, I learned from, uh, uh, I think uh, I forgot his name, but that was this interview with Andrew Yang and he answered that question saying that, uh, 
the gap, like not any computer science or medical researcher can work at this intersection. It takes a huge amount of training to do that. So my question to you is, uh, what kind of what kind of things would you recommend or maybe suggest people when they are working at this forefront based on your experience training a lot of people? Yeah, that, no, it's a great question. I And I certainly wouldn't want to imply that you know, it's all, hand, we're all together in one, you know, uh, we all understand each other perfectly. It, it's definitely still a little bit of a tower of Babel. It's not as bad, I think, as when we started because of that familiarity and probably a little bit of, of um, healthy skepticism, right, on the part of the clinical community too. Um, and then maybe a, a also a healthy respect for the challenges and the difficulty in healthcare by, by sort of the computer science and machine learning groups. But yeah, I, again, I think it, the the what you're doing is is exactly what I think we we've seen be the one of the most successful strategies coming from the computer science side of the aisle, like literally looking at the problem, following. Like we used to say, you know, particularly in the pre-COVID times, I had my students shadowing clinicians that were yeah. performing the tasks, were working in the environment that was related to the project, right? Seeing how the work is done, seeing the challenge, seeing, and, and even having the, the clinician articulate, what are they thinking? Why did they say this? Because it's not always obvious. And sometimes for the clinician, it's not always obvious because it becomes almost a reflex. It's brainstem level knowledge now, right? We've done this for decades and our training is so intense. We just, there's things that we just know by reflex and, and sometimes by instinct. And so how do we start to have that conversation? So that's one way I think that I've seen things be incredibly successful on the other side, you know, I think the clinicians that have said, you know what, I don't need to learn, you know, Python and go through Andrew's course necessarily, but I would like to have a conversational understanding of the types of techniques that are available out there. Uh, what sorts of problems are they good for? What problems are they not good for? So that when I do have that, you know, list of ideas, because every clinician's got a list of ideas of things that they know for sure AI should and, and can do, that list becomes much more realistic after just a little investment on the part of the clinical side to say, okay, clearly a robotic surgeon is not necessarily going to be my first project. <laughs> and we think of something else slightly, you know, slightly more solvable that is still, uh, you know, sort of necessary. And so it, again, this is the, this is what I go, you know, I go back to that comment I made earlier, which is that there, these conversations are happening in real time everywhere in the world between clinicians and machine learning, whether it's, you know, because of a company's approaching them because, you know, they're looking to do cloud migration, or if it's literally an academic environment where, you know, machine learning researchers are reaching out and vice versa. It, 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 we're all meeting each other kind of for the first time, right? We've never really had, besides sort of the field of bioinformatics, which is a very niche area, we really hadn't ever had this broader coming together of these two fields. And, yeah. and there's a lot of things that make us, you know, very different, uh, right? There's the move back, move fast, break things. And there's a the first do no harm. Those are very different cultures to reconcile fundamentally. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I think as we're seeing, again, in the sort of the ecosystem, the startups, the large technology companies, there's still a willingness to say, yes, we under, we're starting to understand it's hard and it's not going to happen tomorrow, but there's still so much value and upside and there's enough signal that we can all agree, I think, that this is still worth doing and this is still uh, possible to achieve. And that optimism, I think, is really what carries me forward. I find reasons to be optimistic every day. And again, the pace of evolution uh, has been staggering. I mean, you just it's you just have to look back five years and realize how far we've come, right, in such yeah. a short amount of time. Um, I, I, I just can't even imagine what we're going to be seeing in the next decade. But I'm I'm confident that we have you know the right kind of stakeholders, the right leaders, the right conversations are going on uh, to make sure that this stuff is effective, it's safe, and it's available to to more people than ever. Yeah, yeah, and and, and since you mentioned like every clinician has kind of a list of things AI should be able to do, like kind of a demanding thing, and since we are in the end of 2022. Uh, what are the things that I think people do make resolutions like this is something I'm very hopeful for 2023. What kind of things that you would say you are hopeful for? Or maybe like if you want to pick at, at least a number, let's say three things that you are really hopeful for this space of AI and medical that you want to see in 2023. What would be that three things? 
this is this is a pretty easy one for me because you know of all the things that have been happening just in the last few months with you know with chat gpt and the large language models and things that we you know we would expect to see in the next you know year or so um i think that we're getting to a place where i expect not just want but expect that large language models are playing a role in both knowledge summarization uh the ability to sort of you know get answers in a very intelligent conversational way uh, both from medical data but also sort of you know literature data uh, to help doctors make better clinical decisions i expect to see large language models as part of the clinical decision making process in the very near future and i expect that to truly transform a lot of aspects of 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 you know sort of the day to day of healthcare um again you'd be surprised to see how challenging it can be if you ever followed a clinician around how hard it is to find things in the chart how hard it is to summarize things uh for a patient how hard it is to have a just a meaningful conversation about this diagnosis means x or um i need to know the the newest best evidence for y these are difficult things they're still you know very time consuming for physicians to do and these are things summarization and you know, knowledge synthesis is, is something that these you know emergent behaviors mm-hmm. that we're seeing in these large languages, they're incredibly good at doing these things. And, and so I, I, you know, putting those two things together, you know, for example, an EHR and a large language model together, what, what could that do for us? Or mm-hmm. medical knowledge as a whole in a large language, what could that do for us? Um, the possibilities are, are really limitless. And the best part, for me at least, is that it doesn't have to be just the things I think are cool or useful. It's actually can be whatever you think is cool and useful, yeah. right? It's every individual clinician might find a use for that, but the, the core fundamental technology that's drawing from is the same. Yeah. That to me is just, you know, really why I'm so excited and optimistic uh, about how, again, these fields coming together, none of this would have ever happened had we not started a conversation, you know, whatever it was years ago. Um, and now we're starting to get to a place where the things that we're looking at, right, the probing that we do of these large language models isn't just based on logic or isn't just based on a Turing test or whatever, an IQ test. It's based on now we're looking at what are the medical capabilities, um, yeah. right? These, this is so cool to see that this is actually an active area of research really advancing forward, um, uh, again, independent of any specific narrow use case. I, I'm, ex- I'm incredibly excited. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That makes two of us, definitely. So, yeah. And one last question before I sign you off is any tips for young researchers? Because most of the audience that listen listens to this podcast are like people, like PhD students or people from medical background. Do you have any tips for those kind of people who are specifically, I, I mean, it's like if, if we want to keep it open, we can keep it open to both the fields. But even if people who are working at the intersection, what kind of tips would you give them for their career as in how what are the pitfalls that you would tell them to definitely avoid and things to look forward as the field progresses and changes every day? <laughs> That's a great question. I, I guess I do have enough gray hair to give some advice now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think, listen, I think in generally, um, always keep an open mind, I think uh, is, is one thing that has really served me well. I think in other words, open to ideas. They may not be in your core area. They may not be in your core field doesn't mean that they're not ideas that you can't sort of incorporate or think about in in your own work or your own area. I think that's one. And then that extends, in my mind, to careers. I think folks get really worked up about, do I do academics? Do I do industry? You know, do I start my own company? As if those are all mutually exclusive options. (laughs) And I think it's important to just, again, talk to older folks, older than me even, if you want. But recognizing that when you look back at the end of your career, just like, you would at the end of your life, what are the things that you'd regret the most? And and probably some of those things would be not taking a chance to do X, Y, Z, or thinking that you didn't have that option to do that. And I would argue that you always have the opportunity with the skill sets that you're developing as part of your PhD program, or maybe you're in medical school, that knowledge is, is flexible and usable in a variety of places. You just need to find things that, that interest you, that you you know are, are so excited about that you, you wake up thinking about it. And if and if that happens to be happening maybe in academia, then that's great. If it's happening in industry, that's that helps make that decision for you. I don't know if that's helpful uh, to those of you out there listening, but 
Um, but but really, I I found myself when I was you know just not even ten years ago thinking, okay, I this is the track and this is it. This is a thirty to forty year career, and I this is what I'll be doing forever. And uh, I guess the, the idea that um, you know these fields are coming together in ways that that haven't ever uh, you know ha has never happened before uh, also means that all of you out there have that same opportunity for flexibility in your career. And and I encourage you to take advantage of it. There's nothing more fun than taking knowledge that you've learned from one domain and seeing how it fits in another domain. And oftentimes you find that not only does it fit, uh, but it also could potentially advance that new area in, in ways that, that you never thought of before. So um, that's probably my best advice. Yeah, no, definitely makes sense. And I think it's very uh, fitful to your portfolio because you have like a very diverse set of portfolio of collaborations coming from a medical background and working some working at place that really creates an impact so definitely i think that advice completely makes sense and yeah hopefully people do that in their respective fields where they are trying to merge knowledge from two different fields and creating something really unique so yeah thanks thanks a lot for that but yeah apart from that i think we are at the end of the podcast so yeah i'll just like to thank you once again i think uh thanks for being on the show at a, such a fun time of the year so definitely it's it's very hard to get people at this time but appreciate you for being on the show and hopefully i can have you once more on the show so yeah thanks again jay it's always a pleasure always always great seeing how your work has progressed and i look forward to seeing what you're doing in the future too thanks again